Sorry. Good morning, everyone. And uh, I'm pleased to be here and to be able to talk to you a little bit about Africa's evolving security challenges. Um, you would notice the uh, title does not just say Africa's security challenges, because we're not going to be just looking at the security challenges of today. We want to see how Africa's security landscape is changing over time. And what this means for you as legislators, for you as African leaders, and for you, hopefully, as um, the change agents um, across um, Africa. So what I want to do is start with a look at some of the key trends that help explain some of the root causes and some of the structural causes of insecurity across the continent. I'm not going to go into each and every one. I'll be looking at four broad categories, and we'll try and pull out lessons from each one. Then I want to talk a little bit about what this means for insecurity, how we could think about addressing some of the challenges, and what are some of the opportunities for you as legislators. First, let's talk about demography. How many people are on the African continent? And what this means for security and insecurity. A lot of the uh, data that we have seems to reflect a growing trend in Africa. By 2050, one in four people on the planet will be African. By 2050, the third most populous country on the planet would be an African country. Let's break these numbers down a little bit and see what they tell us. First, the growth is not just numerical. The growth is according to age brackets. The age bracket that's going to grow the most is the youth. Secondly, the number of dependence on every working African is going to increase because you're going to have more children, more young people without jobs who would be relying on fewer people who would actually be working. The other thing that demography tells us is that it's not going to be across the same across Africa. And it's not going to be the same across space in any one country. Some areas are going to see larger population growth, and others are going to see slower population growth. But the important thing for us to consider when we're thinking about insecurity is when we think about some of what we call the root causes today, inequality, joblessness, poverty, these trends suggest that they're going to pose an even greater challenge in the coming years. What about climate and climate variability? These um, charts also show that most of the African continent is going to be stressed in one of two broad ways. One, temperatures are going to increase. It's going to become hotter. Secondly, the spatial distribution of water resources are likely to change. Some areas are going to see more flooding, but most areas are going to see less water, which means rivers are going to decrease, some lakes will disappear, and water availability for households, for agriculture, for tourism, for energy, for travel is going to be problematic. What does this mean? If you add climate and population, you're seeing that you're going to have more people contending for fewer water resources. You're also going to see people moving from areas of climate stress to areas of relatively little climate stress. 
And this has all sorts of implications, which brings me to migration. <clears throat> if you watch CNN or most other international um, um, news outlets, you would think that the biggest migration challenge facing Africa is Africans leaving the African continent to go to Europe, to go to the Gulf states, to come to America. But the data shows that most Africans who move stay within Africa. What does this mean? It means that if you add population, you add climate stress, you now have people moving to areas where they don't historically belong. And you start having issues relating to the use of resources, like land and water. You also have issues relating to competition for the very few services that do exist. And so that is also likely to intensify insecurity in the coming years. But where are most of the people going to move to in Africa? Brings me to the fourth broad trend, which is urbanization. Africa is the fastest urbanizing continent on the planet. Very soon, over half of Africans would live in cities. This has implications for the rural areas in terms of productivity, in terms of food sufficiency, in terms of security, and also in terms of radicalization. A lot of literature talks about the mega cities, cities that are going to have millions of people living there. If you break that down a little bit, yes, you have mega cities, but in many cases, as one of the charts shows, you're also going to have mega slums, places where services are not provided, places where security is not guaranteed, and places where the nature of overcrowding will be more complex. Currently, when you think about a na national space, you think about things like the rural-urban divide. That's mainly horizontal. Structurally, you're going to see a lot more vertical differentiation in the cities because you're going to have national authorities, sub-national authorities, municipal authorities, informal, um, um, informal systems of governance and oversight, all cohabiting the same space. And so this suggests that if you think through just these four megatrends and what they mean for the future, um, you can see that Africa's security landscape is going to change. Absolutely. And it's going to change not just positively, not just negatively, but also there are going to be some positive opportunities. But from, if you want to wrap this all up and think about what are some of the security implications of this evolution of the root causes of insecurity across the continent, you're definitely going to have more resource competition. You're definitely going to see a change in state-citizen relationships because the state is going to have to respond to people within its territory, people passing through its territory, and the new migrants who are coming in. We're also going to see different types of unrest between groups and also within groups because demographic changes and um, particularly with the um, as regards the working population and the um, children are going to force it's going to start with the informal arrangements but even going up to the national it's going to force a rethink of how we understand group dynamics, 
whether those groups are based on nationality, ethnicity, religion, um, there's going to be a change. And the fact that you're going to have a lot more areas that are not as effectively governed as they should be, we're going to see quite a bit more transnational crime. And the vulnerable groups, which could be um, based on ethnicity, religion, ideology, they're going to increase. But whether you're thinking about the extremism side, poverty side, political violence, electoral violence, resource war wars, piracy, maritime insecurity, um, civil um, unrest, we still also ha we, we have quite um, some opportunities to think about new ways to do it, to address insecurity. Think about this as if you are at a train station and security in Africa is a train. The train has already left the station. Demography is going to happen regardless of what we do now. Climate change is also going to happen. Urbanization is also going to happen. So all of these trends are happening, and they're going to intensify over, over time. Um, we have three broad options. We could either try to slow the train down, do things to minimize the negative impacts of insecurity. We could try to redirect the train, look for the opportunities, and adapt. Or we could try to repurpose the, the uh, train, look for creative ways to form partnerships and coalitions to enhance um, security by addressing the root causes, not just at the national level, but at sub-national level and community level, and even at the household level. What does this mean for us, for you, as legislators? I think, firstly, and most importantly, as legislators, you really need to, um, since um, we do um, define security broadly to include security of the individual, economics, poverty, climate, etc., I think it's important for you in your, in your countries to think through the importance of having a national security strategy that incorporates elements that address the various dimensions of insecurity in your own country. Secondly, I think we need to get smart about the security sector. The security sector is a very complex <laughs> being. And uh, knowing more about what happens in the security sector is only to your benefit, because then you're in a better position to um, address some of the um, challenges and to ask the right questions and to ensure that not just the laws that you um, formulate, but also the oversight that you provide is effective and helps the country move towards human security. Lastly, I think no, then you need to have metrics. You need to be able to measure where you're going. And lastly, I think we need to incorporate con confidentiality. Um, you talk to most people, particularly those in uniform, They'll tell you security is a national secret, it's, a, it's conf confidential. Um, but if it's a national secret and it's a national priority, as representatives of the people in your various countries, there should be mechanisms for you to not just understand it better, but to have avenues for more effective and productive input. That is really, really crucial. And why is this crucial? Brings me to my last slide. It's because I want to challenge you to think about a very simple question. Why should you be interested? And why is your work important? Try to capture it in something we call 
a theory of change. And it starts by, why are you investing time in the security sector? You want to be able to invest in human capacity, yours, prioritize institutional reform in your security sector, and develop effective partnerships, not just with the people in uniform, but also with communities, with the business, with um, religious groups. Um, you have to be able to distill all the various aspects of security relationships. And the reason why you do this is because you are expecting to have improvements in both your legislative functions and your oversight functions. Generally, when you think about um, lawmakers, we just think about them making laws. But the oversight function is very important. Under legislative functions, there are three things I'd like to mention. First, we want to think through how you have laws that anticipate change. Many times, legislators, even unfortunately in this country, we make laws for the challenges that we have right now or that we had yesterday. But how could you look ahead and make laws that anticipate that population is going to change, urbanization is going to change, and then have strategy that um, addresses that? Second legislative focus has to be the citizen-centric focus. Quite um, often, security in Africa focuses on the viability of the state. That's important, and that's crucial. But I think equally important is the security of the individual and the prosperity of every individual who lives in that country, which is why the effectiveness of institutions is important. The laws have to address that as well. Oversight is not just about corruption. Oversight is about ensuring that there is operational efficiency. You have ideal civil military collaboration and that the institutions that are designed to um, exercise oversight are able to do it in a way that ensures sustainable and sustained um, security across the continent. And then, why are you doing all of this? Because as the director right, uh, right correctly um, pointed out, in each of your countries, the goal is to ensure security for all, championed by effective institutions that are accountable to the people. And that is your task. And that, I believe, is a shared goal. And when you think through how you respond to or how you relate to insecurity and evolving insecurity, think about this theory of change and your place in this particular um, milieu. Thank you.